I like to call this second part of the chapter um, the exceptions to all of Mendel's beautiful rules. So we just talked about his seven characters that were really easy to trace because they were either dominant or recessive and they tracked very nicely. Well, the reality is is that um, in most mammals, animals, this is just not going to happen. Um, one gene doesn't always equal one phenotype. Um, what Mendel saw is just very simplistic. And especially in humans, we find that there's a rare time where we have this sort of black and white yes or no answer. Um, a first example to look at this is the coat color in rabbits. And um, the possible phenotypes are four. Dark gray, chinchilla, point restricted, and albino. So this is an example of multiple alleles at one locus. So it's still at the same spot on the chromosome. It's just that there are different ways to inherit that gene. Dark gray would be the dominant color. Chinchilla gives you this gray color and you have to have two of them or chinchilla and nothing. Um, albino is basically nothing and point restricted um, they're showing you as this other gene called H. So we've got gray, chinchilla, points, or albino as our four choices. Of course at any given time you can only have two so um, you do have some limits in what you express. So this is the idea of multiple alleles for the same gene. Mendel just followed two. In reality there could be more than one. In humans there's a gene that um, is on the surface of our blood cells and there can be upwards of 15 possibilities in the human population and you only can have two. So moving on to these exceptions that they found. So before Mendel did his work um, people actually felt that um, traits were blended. So when a man and a woman got married, and you can even see that when you look at your siblings, you would feel that the, the offspring is a mixture of those two people. Um, and the surprising thing that Mendel showed was that no, there's discrete genes that can be inherited. And the genes don't blend because in that F2 generation, remember, you can recover the recessive gene. So this is an example of something that sort of, at the first blush, seems like there's blending going on, but in reality um, the genes still are very segregated um, units. And this, these are snapdragons. Um, in the spring I hope that we'll be able to dissect them and look at their different um, parts of the flower. Um, and snapdragons come in a variety of colors, but if you cross a homozygous white one with, I'm sorry, yeah, homozygous, with a homozygous red one, you get pink. So capital R, little r equals pink one would call that blending. So in pigments and colors, yeah, maybe you do see a blending, but still they're from discrete genes. So this just means that you're making some red pigment and you're making some white pigment and the outcome is incomplete. We don't have a dominant color over the other. One doesn't overshadow the other. They actually mingle and come up with an in-between. And that's okay and it still matches Mendel's work because if you cross pink ones, you cross an RR, capital R, little r, with a capital R, little r, we actually get, we recover the white ones and we recover the red ones and we still have the blended ones for those two um, individuals that have cap uh, heterozygous. We'll draw this Punnett square up and talk about it some more. If you cross a pink one with a white one, half of them will be pink still and half of them will be white. And again, we'll draw those Punnett squares up to prove that to ourselves. So it's the idea of incomplete dominance. One gene does not overshadow the other. You actually see a mixture of the two of them. In color, it comes out as a blend just because. An example of multiple alleles and incomplete dominance is our blood types. So you may have heard people talk about, oh, I'm blood type A, I'm B, I'm AB, or I'm O. It's a result of a gene loci, we're gonna give it an I, and sometimes you could have an A, sometimes you could carry a B, sometimes you could carry both, and then there's a third possibility of nothing. So what is A, B, and nothing? It's basically the presence of the A carbohydrate on the surface, a B carbohydrate on the surface, or no carbohydrate on the surface. And it's, um, it's defined by the reaction of people's antibodies or blood to somebody else's blood. I'm going to skip that nomenclature a little bit um, over there and we'll, we'll do a lot of uh, Punnett squares to look at this. But basically if 
if you are blood type A, you are either a homozygous A or heterozygous AO. If you're B, you're homozygous B or you're heterozygous BO. If you are AB, you have both the A and the B carbohydrate on your surface. And if you're O, you have nothing. So um, you could give your blood to anybody because they will not see you as foreign because you have nothing on there for them to see as foreign. Again, we'll be doing some of these Punnett squares in class. I think you really have to draw them out to see what's going on. Idea of multiple alleles, and in this case, they're co-dominant because one is not going to overshadow the other. They're just there on the surface. One of my favorites, the third, what are we up to? Yeah, about the third um, example of things that Mendel couldn't have seen because he just didn't look at it. Uh, would be my favorite Labrador Retriever colors. I have a big black one at home, so I'm fond of black labs. So it turns out this is a term called epistasis, and they're saying that the genes interact epistatically, but the term for this is epistasis, and basically it means that one gene determines the fate of another. So in this case, we're going to say that coat color is determined by two genes. You can carry the dominant black gene or the recessive brown gene, or a mixture of the two. If you are capital B, lowercase b, you're still black. Um, and then you have this other gene called E. I don't know why they picked E, but it's whether the color is deposited or not, not deposited. Capital E, you get the color in the hair shaft. Lowercase e, there's no color deposited in the hair shaft. So you can see that you can cross two black labs. This one is a heterozygote dihybrid and this is a dihybrid. So we're going back to that dihybrid cross again and we're just reinterpreting what that means. So all these guys are black because they have the dominant gene for deposition. They have at least one capital E and then they have at least one capital B for being black. You can be brown if you have the dominant genes for color dis deposition but you have the recessive alleles for color. And then your yellow, or in some cases, extreme cases, like a white looking color, doesn't matter what your color gene is because you have the recessive form of color deposition. So that means that you don't put color in your, in your hair shaft no matter what. So you have to be a blonde or a light colored lab. My other lab wants to go outside. So that's how um, coat color can be inherited epistatically. Oops, go back. Um, and one slide that, that's not on here is the idea of skin color. And human skin color is, is coded for by not just two genes, um, color and then no deposition of color, but actually four. So imagine instead of this, we have this huge um, panel that tracks four genes, not just two. And you have a whole gradation of um, color possibilities from all dominants to all recessives and then every kind of mix and match in between. And that would uh, probably describe our, our skin color, which is why humans are a little more difficult. So I'm going to stop here and then the next podcast will deal with Morgan and the flies and the chromosomal basis of inheritance.